This morning's scripture comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Good morning. Hey, man. I don't know if the singing is as good on this side as it is on this side. I'm just going to tell you, having two sopranos in the back is amazing. just wanted you all to know that. It's just a suggestion. I'd sit over there next week. My introduction to this passage was different. The first time I ever told people about it, there were six of us. I was one, so there would be five more. See, I'm good at math. Um, one was my wife. She had a different answer to this passage than any of the others. The first one told me they would look into it. They said, I'm not really sure if that means what it says. I'll look into it. Second person I told, she said her daddy was a preacher and an elder, and he, she said, that's not what it means. He says so. Interesting answer. Another one told me that's not how the Church of Christ does it, so that's not correct. Another answer. And the sweet lady, the sweet one, she's tiny little one, she said that her commentary said that they, this didn't mean what it said. Now, when we look at a passage of Scripture, I've given you four of the answers to this passage. You can say the Church of Christ tradition doesn't allow for us to follow the Bible. Woo, dangerous statement, right? Church of Christ is all about the Bible. Second one. Let me go read my commentaries and then tell you what the Bible says. Eh, not really comfortable with that one either. Not really comfortable with saying my daddy is. I don't even care who he is. And really uncomfortable saying, eh, I'll look at it and lying to you and saying I'll look at it later. But my wife gave me a different answer. She told me this. She said, if the Bible says it, why would I do anything else? And so what happened was, my wife said that, and later that night I proposed. I mean, it makes sense, right? Meet the girl. She says, I'm going to follow the Bible and say, marry me. It worked for me, guys. That is the rest of the story, is that you know that it was actually this passage of Scripture is the reason I married my wife. This is a different passage of Scripture. It's not something we deal with every day, and we're going to take it a little differently because... It doesn't fit our culture, our tradition, and it doesn't fit those things, but it is nonetheless the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything, and hold firmly the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand... That Christ is the head of every man, and man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. Let's begin. I have a Greek word in here. If you didn't notice, I used a Greek word up here. Akatalupto. It's the only word that's not in English, so I was trying to make it easy. And the other time it says katalupto. One means ah, not covered. No ah, covered. And the first thing I want to get to at is I have heard that this has something to do with hair. Do not ever believe that. Simply for the fact you will see this word over and over. When we mention hair, we will not use this word. I guarantee it. I put it in Greek so you can see it's not the same word. The reason this is dangerous is, one, it's very mean. Two, it's very hateful. If you take it to be hair, you have made someone's physical appearance 
a sign of godliness. There is nothing in Scripture that will ever tell you to do that. Nothing in Scripture is going to say, look at the outward appearance and then judge the person. And if you take this as hair, sorry. The point is, the word is not the same. I'm going to show you this word over and over, and I want you to get something. There are a lot of things in our life that can take away a woman's hair, right? There are diseases. There are treatments for diseases, which, you know, sometimes the sickness caused by diseases is just as bad as the disease. But what we've created here is, by saying long hair is a covering, is this dangerous idea that a factor that no one can control makes someone holy or unholy. And, and how could you imagine if you had a disease, I don't care which one it is, or you just had premature balding, right? And we had this woman who didn't have long hair because she couldn't have long hair. And we told her, long hair is that covering commanded by God. Do you imagine how much we just destroyed a sister in the faith? How much we have taken something that they had no control over and said, well, because of this, you're not holy. I dated a girl in college. She wanted to give her hair to locks of love. I prefer Pantene Beautiful Length. But these programs, what they do is they, they take hair and they make wigs for people who have lost their hair so that they can feel beautiful. So that they can feel accepted, especially children who suffer through this. And she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it because she had been taught something over and over so long that she had to have long hair, that cutting off eight inches and giving it to children who needed wigs, she couldn't do it. And it tore her up because, obviously, she wanted to. She wanted to love on children. But because someone had mistaught her in the past, couldn't do it. So if all I do today is destroy your idea that long hair is the covering, thank you. I've had a great day. But I'd also like to challenge us more than just talking about head coverings today. I want to talk about when we don't like scripture. When we come to the scripture and God says this and we're like, we've always done this. My commentary says this. My dad taught me this. What do we do? Do we actually do like the Bereans and go, let me search the word daily? And see what God's word says instead of going, let me run to an answer I like. Let me have itching ears to hear what I want to hear. But instead, let's go to God's word and say, this is God's word. I don't want a second opinion. Verse 7. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman originated from man, so also man has his birth through the woman. And all things originate from God. Second thing I want you to notice, none of these arguments have been cultural at all. If you think God being the head of a man is cultural, we got bigger issues. If you think the order of creation is cultural, we got bigger issues. We got major issues if you're saying that the angels have something to do with our culture. Sorry. The truth is, there's nothing in here that brings out a cultural argument. But what is brought out is, God is saying that there is an order of creation. There is. Woman was made for man. But did you notice how quickly he goes, but wait, but wait, don't just grab onto that. He says, now think about it a second. Man now comes from woman. Men don't produce men. It's okay. We're safe, right? But what he's saying is, yes, that's the creation order. But instead of us wanting to go to this sexist and hateful position again, he says, but wait, you do realize man now comes from woman and that one is not without the other. Woman is not independent of man. Man is not independent of woman. Verse 13. 
He presents it another way. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach? This is what nature teaches here. That if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Told you to say a different word, right? But if anyone's inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. He presents it. It's another argument. And what he's saying is nature teaches something. Natural, natural order would tell you that it's more normal for a woman to have long hair. That's a natural thing. He's not saying God says that we always follow nature and whatever feels natural, do it. That's a dangerous idea, too. But what he is saying here is nature gives her a different type of covering. This prebola, right? And I want you to see how this makes sense. Prebola, circle. Think circle, okay? If How many of y'all have bangs or know what bangs are? I need y'all to know what bangs are. I know that's weird. It's weird that we're talking about bangs again. Bangs are those things that keep your hair out of your eye, right? I used to have one of those mop tops went around like this. And to see you, I'd part my eyes like that. And so if I had bangs, obviously I could see you. But if you think about hair and just natural, don't touch it, nobody gets bangs or anything, your hair covers what? Everything. It is a ribola. It is a circle. And that's the word. The other word literally means to cover. And it doesn't say cover the face. It just says cover the head. And in Greek, that's an important distinction. But then again, I want you to see the arguments presented here. He says, judge for yourself. Is it common? And for the first 1900 years of the church, no, it was not common. No one ever did it. Two, he says, nature suggests that women should cover their head. Three, he says, but if you've got a problem with this, it doesn't matter because all the churches do this. Funny thing about this is, this is the passage of Scripture that most people go, this was written to the Corinthians and only to the Corinthians. The churches of God are not in Corinth. One church is in Corinth. So we talk about this. Let's go to the Bible. We have a slide just titled the Bible. And I just want to look at that one phrase because the issue today is not about head coverings. I've got a slide with these pictures, and what it is, is it's the pi historical pictures. It is. You have year 100. I tried to get year 100 to 1900. Obviously, I didn't. But it's the pictures of what it looked like when women looked at the Bible and they said this, I don't care, the Bible says. And if the Bible said to you that every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesied disgraces her head, and you said, that's in the Bible. And we took that concept, and we stopped talking about head coverings for a second. We used it for everything. What if any time the Bible said anything, we said, well, I, we don't care what our normal practice is. What, what if we found something in the scripture and we liked it or we didn't like it. And we said, I'm not going to cut that out of scripture. I don't care. I, I don't even have to like it. And I looked at that same scripture and I said, I'm not going to tape over it with some commentary. I said, no, it's the word of God. I don't care what it says. And we started this. And no matter what the Bible said, we said, I don't care. The Bible is the word of God. I may not like it. I may not agree with it. It may not fit my culture. It may not fit our habit. And I don't care. Because our alternative is this. Take this in any other way and say, well, it's cultural. Then tell me which verse I can't make cultural. Our, our society wants to tell us that this verse is cultural. The one on women preachers is cultural. The one about gays is cultural. They, they have a list of things we'd like to like us to believe is cultural. And, and you know what? If you're going to tell me this passage is cultural, 
Don't tell me where I have to stop. It's just unfair to make yourself God. And if you were to take this and you were to say, but I, I read a commentary somewhere and it talked about prostitutes and uncovered heads. First, I'm going to tell you it's not really true. Mithras prostitutes always covered their heads. Apollos prostitutes always covered their heads. So it's not true. But if you looked at this and you said, I just don't care about anything but God. And, and, and I, I use this passage to obviously talk to you more than about just head coverings. I'm not, I'm not that interested in head coverings. What, what I'm really interested in is, what happens when you find a piece of scripture and it's new to you? Or, or you've never read it and you come across it and it says something and you're just like, that's not the way I learned that. And, and you took that scripture and you said, what if I just believed it? And, and I'm, I'm not really interested in this specific passage being the end-all, beat-all. This is our first 1900 years of church history. Everybody did it. The, the question is, what do you do when it's harder than that even? What do you do when you're reading through the scripture and it just doesn't mesh? You, know, you, you find God calling you to do something and you go, God, but I've always thought that was wrong. And God tells you, no, that's actually what I command. And most of you have looked at one word in here, probably because I kept telling you to. Focus on covering, and I want you to focus on two other words in this. This is, this is addressed to men and women together. It's addressed how the men should act and how the women should act. And this is where I start to get uncomfortable. Obviously, I'm comfortable with the head covering part. The uncomfortable part is praying and prophesying. And I'd love to tell you the answer is. And I'd, I'd love to be that, but I'm not that kind of person. I'm the kind of person who will look at the Bible and tell you, I'm not really sure how that works. I'm the kind of person who can honestly admit, when women are praying and prophesying in the presence of men, I don't really know how that works. I, I know it's in the scripture, and it's something I continue to struggle with. I do. But that's what I'm challenging you today with all scripture. Struggle with it. Look at it and go... You know, I've been taught that women are not allowed to pray with men. I've always been told this. This is my raising, my teaching, everything. And then I look at this passage and I start getting uncomfortable because I say, why is this in the middle of a context where it's talking about worship? Chapter, verse 17, 18, 19, 20, to the end, it's going to actually talk about the Lord's Supper and when we come together and take communion. And the difficult part is right here, do we actually wrestle with it? Do we come to God and we say, whatever your word says, I'm going to wrestle with it. I I'm not going to say, God, I already believe what I believe. Don't try to change me any. I came to you. I gave you my life. Quit messing with me. But I say, God, your word is powerful. It is mighty. I want you to change me. And we go through our three things. One, where we start by, we share the scripture. We share Jesus. And if all we know is Jesus, we say, Jesus died for my sins. And they're like, what day did he die on? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, anything else to tell me? Yeah, Jesus. And we start with, we share what we know. And the second thing I told you to do, apply what you know. You know, whatever you know in the scripture, start applying it. Share it with people and then try to get it to fit in your life and work it. And the third is seek the scripture. Don't be afraid of changing to match God. Don't be afraid of going that direction because change is always treated as this left word. It is. It's this concept that if I change, I'm going away from God. And it's not always that way. Sometimes God calls us to change, and it's into his image. He calls us to change, and it's to match his word. 
You've, you've heard me call myself left. The correct answer is I am not left. I'm not. I'm actually so far right, I'm left. That made sense, right? You go so far right, you turned around. Yep. You know, have you noticed that three right turns is a left turn? Yeah, it's kind of me. Well, well, it kind of works. But what happens is I am so conservative. I am actually a textual conservative. I believe that if the Bible said jump off a cliff, I would go find a cliff. And that is the only way that God can fully change us is if we go to his word and we actually seek it. We say, God, I, I don't know everything. I don't. And I've told you that. I've admitted when he talks about praying or prophesying with men present, I don't know what we're talking about. I don't know how to take that. I don't know what to do with it. And I can take that mystery that I have in my life right now. And I can say, one, Forget it. You know, let's just ignore it. Let's go to easier passages. Let's find something in the Bible that I can, you know, really cling on to. I like that whole, you know, love the Lord and love my brother. And, you know, that one's hard. I'm going back to the one I like so much. I'm going back to the fruits of the spirit. I'm going back to the stuff I liked. You know, back when I was this big and I learned things in the church that always made sense. And God said... Why are you still on milk? Why are you always the milkman? They give me a nickname in class. I am called the milkman. I hate that title. They call me the milkman. Problem with, with my preaching is I love to stick with the milk. I do. I'm going to talk to you about Jesus and hope and love and just dwell on it forever. And that's me. That's what I like. And they pointed out a scripture to me and it said, you begin in milk and then you go on to meat. And if this isn't ribeye, I don't really know what is. This is hard stuff, right? Yeah, this is hard stuff. And if we just say, well, it, it's hard, let's give up on it then how can we read the scripture that says all scripture is God-breathed? We can't. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correction, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's struggle with passages that are different than we think. Let's be open to change in his direction. Let's be open for God to have written us a letter and us say, God, thank you. I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm going to work through it. And I'm going to work it until I can get it to that second step where I can apply it. And I'm going to be a person, not only of the milk, but I'm going to want the meat in the word too. I'm going to want those passages that I have to turn against my raising, my culture. And I have to say, I stand on the word of God. Because as our culture changes, we're going to have to do it with a lot more subjects. If you have not noticed, it is now unchristian, don't ask me how this one works, to say that gays are wrong. Whoa, Christianity has changed. And it has. And we're going to have to do a lot more of this where we go, I know you're giving me a cultural argument. I know you're throwing this at me. I don't care. I want the Bible. I want what it says. And as, as we change and as we approach this new generation we've got more difficulty in standing up to our culture standing up to everything around us and saying i don't care i want to do what the bible says and god gives us a hope in second timothy 4 second timothy 4 verse 6 through 8 for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who has loved his appearing. 
There's reason to stand up. There's reason to defend it. He says, I have fought. He doesn't say I've existed. He doesn't say I showed up. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have fought. I have been poured out. And I am ready. And to be able to say to God at the end of our life that I have been poured out. I have fought for you. And to him to say, here is your crown of righteousness. Come to dwell with me forever. And only in Christ are we offered this righteousness, this opportunity to fight, this opportunity to be used, applying his word and spreading it. Today, if there is anyone who does not have that hope of an eternal crown, all the struggles you go through are pointless. But if we have that hope of an eternal crown because we have trusted that Christ is Lord and confessed him as Lord, repented of our sins, been buried with him in baptism and raised with him, then our fight and all our struggles are worth it. And if there's anybody who needs prayers or wishes to submit to the eldership here, we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.